Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where we interview entertainment pros about their careers and how they became successful in the industry. The secrets to their success here every week. Here's your host, Sean Ventura. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Ventura, and I just want to say subscribe on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you are, and tell your friends and share the episodes on social media. Okay, thanks. My special guest today is Greg Schaefer, showrunner for the new Netflix show, Bruise Brothers. He also talks about being a writer for that 70s show and mad about you. So it's going to be fun. Here we go. How did you and when did you know that you wanted to be in the uh, TV industry? Were you a kid, were you in high school, or in college? Was it something that you watched or uh, when did you know? It's a good question. You know, I got to say I had the entertainment bug at a really, really young age. I grew up uh, in uh, a podunk Midwestern town, uh, um, you know, outside of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, but really a, a far way outside of Cleveland, Ohio, Warren, Youngstown area um, in northeastern Ohio. And, uh, you know, just like suburbia town, like everywhere else. And uh, good place to grow up. I played a lot of sports, but I also did. A, I wanted to do theater. And believe me, I didn't have my parents pushing me or anything like that. And Long story short, I was a kid, and this is an embarrassing way to start this, but uh, <laughs> I, I happened to be in the right play at the right time, and some like theater scout uh, took me to New York and I uh, auditioned for a Broadway show, and I happened to get it. Wow, very cool. Uh, oh, yeah, that, there's the happy part. Don't what was worry, the show? Pretty sad pretty quickly. <laughs> it's, uh, it was The Little Prince and the Aviator. It was based on that uh, French book, The Little Prince. Okay. Uh, there were two problems with it. They They... Well, they turned it into a musical, which is great. And uh, but uh, Michael York, who was a pretty famous yeah, know 70s Michael, yeah. actor, yeah, and a great actor, not the best singer. And uh, <laughs> it didn't, you know, it was like a dream come true. Well, at any age, but certainly as a kid. And uh, it basically closed in, in previews. And uh, uh, so my my Broadway career was uh, very uh, ephemeral, very brief. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, and then after that, though, I had a little bit of the bug, and I somehow became like a child actor while kind of keeping a normal life and going to school in Ohio. Hmm. Did some soaps. I did. I was on a soap for a couple of years. I uh, did some uh, a lot of commercials, and uh, to be honest, I thought I was just going to act, and I was really into music too. I was going to act and like, maybe be in a. Rock, I was in a rock band, and I had no desire to even go to college, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, my parents uh, kind of thought otherwise and said, well, you're applying and all that. And uh, so I did do that. And uh, I I was always, I mean, I was an English major, so I was certainly interested in writing and it kind of came naturally. And I, okay. I, I looked at that as another creative process. But the writing bug itself really didn't hit me until after college. Um, I, actually, I actually still did some... Um, I don't want to say acting per se as much, but I was, I did some voiceovers mm. as a voiceover artist. I did some when I was a kid and then I still had some connections after college. And I lived in, uh, in the city in New York and, uh, did that to make a living. But I think, uh, something kind of hit me in just the, um, the randomness and the difficulty of, uh, uh, and my heart goes out to every actor, you yeah. know, that part of it that, uh, I still wanted to do something creative and I had friends that had been, uh, writing in college and moved on. And my brother who I'm you know, doing this current show with was already starting to write and, and it just kind of hit me. And I, I, I teamed up with this guy who, um, was an assistant at the uh, voiceover agency to rep me. And he kind of gone through the same thing, went to NYU film school and didn't know what to do with it. And, uh, we're like, so we teamed up and started writing and, uh, you know, uh, thought we were ready in a month. And the best advice I ever got was not to come out to LA for at least another two years till we mm. uh, really had a good spec script. And, uh, yeah, I started writing professionally. Um, Oh, I'm going to date myself. Uh, started writing professionally, moved out to LA in 97. So okay. about 19 shows later, here we are. Wow. And, and what was the, how did you get in? Did you have an agent that sent the script and you didn't even meet anybody or did you have a meeting and they read through it or how did, yeah. how did it work I mean, for the people who haven't done this? Totally. I mean, look, the, there were, 
we can we can talk about like just the um, the way to get into the business then versus now. We can talk about the um, and just the different landscape where there were tons of you know I primarily write half hour sitcoms, but right. there were tons more shows then. But in a way, there's a lot more content now. Just it's more like the wild west. So there's 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 pluses and minuses to both. Right. Uh, the best advice I ever got, and it really was from my brother and some other writers and connections, was don't really come out or don't really send something to an agent until it, you've been vetted by uh, people in the business or people who have your back that say this is good. Because, okay. and I guess that, the, and and I can't, and it sounds so. Um, I don't want that at all to sound stuffy as in, oh, please, it's so easy to write stupid television and write a joke. <laughs> and so there's right. so much bad shit. There's so many bad shows and you can hate half the shows I've been on. I, I, it's not about that, but there really is a rhythm. And, and you got to remember everyone and their brother wants to be in the entertainment industry. I don't care right. if it's acting or writing or directing. And there is a process. And if you really, really want to stand out, your only real resume, at least on the writing side, is writing, a, having a great, great script. Now, I will say today it's changed a little bit because everyone can kind of self-produce and maybe that thing instead of a script is a great video content or something you're doing okay. you know, on social. So things things have changed a little bit. However, if you have a great script, it's still going to be, it's still a, a trump card. To, Are uh, there to a lot more shows though now? It's, I mean, it, it, well, there Before are it seemed a like lot there are more, less shows. There's like thousands of shows now with all these streaming yeah, services. Yeah, you know, yes. The, the difference is this. There used to be, and there were too many if you ask me, but there used to be 45 sitcoms on network television. Okay. So yeah, there's not as many sitcoms was, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and in order, you know, the the to really make a great living in, in television, besides actually creating a show, you want to get on a network show that just happens to, to pay more and in the old days would usually do the, the full season was about 22 episodes. And now, um, yeah, there are tons more shows and tons more content, but you, you know, you, you're happy if you're doing eight episodes or 10 episodes or 12 episodes, and yet it still may take the whole year or it's hard to get a second job when you're under contract with that show. So again, they're, they're, I may be getting ahead of ourselves. What was it like when you first started? Well, I, I did have a writing partner and uh, we okay. were both, Super, super excited. We we did uh, heed my brother and other people's advice about, yes, we wrote this great spec script. We thought it was amazing. It was actually a, a news radio. <laughs> uh, that says how old we are. And uh, and we just thought it was fantastic. And and uh, we were told to basically throw it out. And we started, I think we wrote three other scripts before uh, friends and other writers said, oh, yeah, this is pretty good. You should send it to an agent. And uh, they were right because the, the script we ended up doing, uh, agents really responded to. They liked it. And because of that, we got an agent and we were okay. sent out for staffing. Um, this would have been uh, 97. So in the uh, kind of the spring of 97, and there was a brand new show on NBC called Veronica's Closet that had the pushiest time slot um, in the country right after Seinfeld. Oh, wow. And, uh, oh, we were psyched. And it was such a strong pilot. And Kirstie Alley had been on Cheers. Oh, is that what it was? It, it was, was Kirstie. I yeah, remember the show, was, the name yeah, of the show. Yeah. So those are all the pluses. Uh, and then you kind of realized um, there were some really funny writers on it. And I, I learned so much on that show because uh, we actually shared a kitchen with the Friends writing staff. It was the same creators as Friends. Okay. So there were a couple of writers on Friends that would consult a couple days a week. So I have nothing but fond memories of it. Uh, it was, but it was tough because. Uh, it was a very good pilot, but I think in some ways it may have been a little bit of an ill-conceived show and that it was, um, it was hard to have sympathy for this, uh, the, the character that Christy Alley played just cause she kind of had all these great things going on right? and, um, um, a little bit of problems of the rich mm -hmm. anyway, but regardless, it was still a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And I learned so much, but, but it was, uh, but I also learned, you know, we, uh, we weren't asked back that next year. So we're out of the gate. Like it was a good experience. I, I got a lot of stuff done. Got, I learned a lot. And then just like that, um, I had to get another job. Now, mind you, um, it turned into a blessing, a blessing in disguise. We, uh, my writing partner and I got on mad about you, which was oh, wow. fantastic. And, uh, that was, that was my second job and a whole other group of writers. And, uh, 
um, just and learn just, so much more. Just yeah. Interrupt and uh, understand. Like, are you 18 writers in a room and then you break off to do scenes or, or are you just oh, with sure. your yes. partner I mean, doing it, one show, writing oh, the whole show? I would say, now every show is a little different, but for the most part, there are, at least back in the day, around maybe 10 to 12 writers okay. sit around a big like conference room table. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really, it's a dream. It was a dream come true. You sit around the room, make jokes for a living all together and eat way too much. <laughs> uh, and then sometimes you would split into smaller rooms, like a joke room to fix up a scene. Sometimes, okay. um, they would, we would, if we were way behind on a script or something was thrown out by the network or the actors or the head writer, we would throw, throw away a script and then have to rewrite it completely. So we would all individually go off and write scenes after outlining it together. But the normal structure is at the beginning in pre-production, you would all talk about ideas, slowly start formulating, arcing, maybe out, you know, the first 13 episodes and, and outlining some episodes together. And then each uh, writing group or writer would go off. The showrunner would assign a script. So even though you would maybe, if it's the script you're writing, it may not be the one that was your idea. It's just sometimes it's a pecking order by hierarchy. Other times it's just, well, you, you may be better at this shit, this idea. So it's a little bit of both. You work together as a group, then you go off and write, and then you get back together and tear it apart and rewrite. And that doesn't even include all the other chefs in the kitchen, which are the studio notes and the network notes and uh, sometimes actors or other producers. And I will say, I was always amazed there was anything good on network television because it just felt like there were so many chefs in the kitchen that it, by the time you'd done enough rewrites, you kind of forgot what the initial nugget of a story was. And that 70s show, um, so you, you were a supervising producer there, not a writer. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm happy like? to talk about that too. I mean, just, just to take one step back, sure. the, as you kind of work up um, as a, a writer, um, mm. whenever you see producer, I'm sorry, not whenever you see producer, but uh, writers as they have, uh, more than three years experience end up being called, uh, producers. Oh, okay. So it really does. So you're work still like writing, for, but they call you a hundred percent. I was, yes. I mean, do we take on more producing, um, jobs like helping in editing sometimes mm. maybe, but probably not up until, yeah, maybe supervising your co-exec if it's your episode to help the showrunner. But basically the titles really do go from staff writer to story editor to executive story editor, and then co-producer, producer, supervising co-exec, exec. Right, so right. it really just meant um, a higher level writer. Cool. Um, yeah, but the 70 show was uh, just a phenomenal experience. And it was, uh, it was, different than a lot of shows I'd been on because a lot I had been on from the beginning where you're kind of creating a new world. And this was actually, well, like mad about you it was the last year of the show. Okay. And, uh, so it was a very well run, well oiled machine. by then. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was, um, just a great place to work. And I mean, we would, there, there weren't late, late nights on rewrites because it pretty much, you knew what the show was. The actors did their jobs. And even though they were pretty famous by then and doing stuff, they, they, you know, they, they put in the work, they were professional about it. And then, uh, and then, uh, but you know, you got home early. It was, it was a, uh, it was a dream job in that way. It was probably, you know, in some ways the the most high profile show I'd been on, but it also had the best hours. Right. And, and do you, um, do you watch previous shows or do you have do you go to the set and watch the taping? Does that help you with the writing or, or is it just yeah, watching older great, shows? It's a great question. I mean, I, I think, you know, we did have some friends just because we've been on so many shows who were on that 70s show like the beginning who had recommended us to the showrunners and but we still had to interview for the job. And I had certainly seen 70s and I was a fan of it, but uh we, you have to do your homework because it's funny in the, in the last season, I think in the last two seasons of seventies, uh, all the pencils in the room, some, one of the writers had pencils made and it was a 70s show. Yeah, we did that. Like, you know, they'd had so many episodes. Been there, like, done every that. Time, yeah. Yes. Every time you pitch something immediately, the show owners are like, uh, I mean, that's kind of like something we did in season two, episode 14. <laughs> Eight and years you know, ago. You're, you're mortified. <laughs> of course it would happen. It would happen anyway, even with writers who'd been there the whole time. But you at least had to have an idea of, you know, somewhat, you know, character arcs and, and relationships. So you're not, 
you know, um, pitching a, a, a relationship that literally happened, you know, a couple seasons earlier. So right. yeah, you, you got to do your homework. Of course, uh, you know, a lot of that even back then was, uh, old VHS tapes. And, and the process, uh, you don't have to go crazy detailed, but just the process of an episode. I know with the animation stuff, it's a year, but was it super quick turnaround? Because you said it was a well-oiled machine. Like, did it yes, take a month I, to I write the say, script and like a the, day to the, shoot the show? Uh huh. The beauty of television, especially um, multicam television, I, I, I've done about half and half with single cam and, and multicam where mm-hmm. there's the audience or at least a laugh track or that kind of thing. But the beauty of that is it, the immediacy of it, the immediacy from sure. There may be a few weeks four to seven weeks of pre-production where you're kind of coming up with all the ideas. Right. But then once production starts, it would be most shows would table read on a Monday and then they'd rehearse on a, on a a Tuesday and there'd be a producer's run through the director would already put it up on its feet. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, there'd be a network run through. And then Thursday, they may do some pre-shoots and Friday you shoot it in front of an audience. You're done every week. So Monday to Friday, you are done. So that is the, the, it was That's a, nice. And, yeah, it's nice. And then even the editing and other things, I mean, you could do a show and be ready to go, you know, gosh, they really could be ready in a, in a week or two after, but you know, they're usually a few weeks ahead. Right. So right. even with, yeah, even with pre-production and developing the script and writing still like the immediacy of a swing set, meaning a set that's not one of the normal sets, um, on, on the stage, uh-huh. um, they could build that set, you know, in a day or two. And it just, the, the immediacy of that compared to some single camera things or, or films that take, you know, weeks and weeks, right. it was, uh, kind of gratifying to see. So let's go to the Goodwin games. Uh, Anything to say about that? Because you got T.J. Miller, Scott Foley. He was just in some yeah, spy Scott, show. Scott's a really interesting and I know guy he, was too. A, he does some writing too, and a lot, a lot of dramatic work. And, he does. Uh, T.J. Miller, who's you know had some issues, I know uh, more recently, uh, but uh, back then he was pretty crazy, but a sweet guy and just bizarre as could be and, and fun. So I've got to say, <laughs> I can't. This was pre uh, all Silicon Valley stuff. And, and there have been some issues since. So I, right. I'm not, I'm only basing it on the experience I had when he was there and he was a, he was a joy to work with. But that was a really fun show in that it was a, it was a new show and the creators of that created how I met your mother. These guys, uh, Carter Bays and Craig Thomas, who were again, just okay. phenomenal writers. And I think one thing for them though, is they had such success with, um, with, uh, how I met your mother that I think they kind of just assumed that this would have the same success. And, uh, I certainly wanted to, cause I thought it was, it was a beautiful concept. And in a way it was almost like a, a comedy version of lost and that they had actually thought this whole show through for about four or five seasons. And it was basically about how this family, uh, was going to find, uh, was going to get their, their father's inheritance. And they had to work through issues as they right. did it, but they had actually worked backwards on how to, how to do this. And, and this is one of those things where it was a great show. It was a great concept. And if it were given time, I think it really would have taken off, but it just happened to be that the uh, president of the network at Fox never believed in it, only picked it up because they were who they were. They had a big deal, um, at 20th. And, uh, so he didn't believe in it. And as soon as the numbers weren't there, we were canceled in seven episodes. It's just like that. That is wow. the, that's the nature of the And beast. let's talk about that for a little bit because we, we all know that Seinfeld, nobody watched the first year and it was one of the biggest shows of all time. So do ne- uh, certain networks give shows a, more of a chance than others or it just has to do with the studio head? Because if you don't give it a couple yeah. of years, man, the first year is tough. is tough. I'd say the first couple of years are tough because it's two things. Yeah. Even with a phenomenal cast and great writing, it takes a while to gel. The actors got to figure out who the characters are. The, the writers got to yep. figure out who the actors are and what, and, and still, you know, working out kinks. Um, Seinfeld was very fortunate in that the exec who kind of brought Jerry and Larry in really went to bat for them. And he wasn't in the normal like TV development. And he actually came from late night in New York. So he, are you saying Larry David or someone else? Oh, um, the NBC exec, about- the NBC exec who brought the show. In. Okay. So no, it was Larry and, and Jerry. And, okay. Um, and, I'm, right. and I know a lot about the show because my, my, uh, my brother who, wor- who worked on it as well. And I, they were given a chance 
to develop, even though the show uh, wasn't there yet. That would almost never happen today. And that, that and, and by today, I mean really mm. over the last 20 years. Unfortunately, the one thing that killed yeah. that in network television more than anything else is reality television. It's now look, there's some good that can be said about reality television. It's easy to watch. It's cheap. Um, there, when there's some good show, when there's, when it's done well, I think it's, it's fine. It's not really reality. So much of it is fixed, but, but what happened is they knew they could get great yeah. ratings. So if something wasn't good, if anything, it sped up the cancellation of shows. So something that you'd want a year or two, if you didn't get good numbers in the first three or four episodes, well, they just cancel you and put on a, who wants to be a millionaire? Yeah, oh, so it was, yeah, it was frustrating. And let's let's talk about that for a little bit too. Um, so the yeah. Office, right? So there was a British Office uh, with Ricky Gervais, and it was oh, hilarious. Yeah. And then, so that show had all these episodes they could go through. They could research characters because they're really just recreating it for America. And and that I, I don't know if it was successful off the bat, but it was one of the biggest shows of all time, is, and especially with people mm -hmm. rewatching oh, it. Yeah. I think my kids have watched that '70s show and an Office of like course, forty yeah. times through. Um, so that's kind of a thing. It's like really hard when you have a show and you just start from scratch and nobody knows any of the characters or. And this, I, they they almost had like a leg up or a, a better chance because it was already done. And they do that with a lot of shows. They, I think Homeland is based yep. on an Israeli show. Yep. Uh, so it, it's almost like they have a better chance. No with that. question. But, no, there, uh, there is a there is a reason why. Um, it's also it it's it's safer. You know, when execs buy a project or a network buys a project, they're like it's almost like a security blanket. Well, it's like all right. There's an adaptation. Now, look, there are many that have failed as well. And Greg Daniels behind that, the office, and they couldn't just do the British office because Ricky Gervais is his own uh, phenomenal curmudgeon and Steve Carell put a different slant right. on it. But I think it did take the show a little bit of time right. to figure out and to, to, to get into its own, even though it was always well written. And uh, so, yeah, that, that is an exception to the rule of what I was saying, though. There are chances where, and, and NBC also, I think, just decided this guy's a star. We're going to keep this on. We're going to say it's a hit. And it never got phenomenal numbers. But now if you look at it for, mm -hmm. you know, longevity and stuff, yeah, in, st in the streaming world and everything else, it's uh, it's beyond a hit and, and super just incredible. Yeah. And I, I don't want to jump ahead and, and skip Lab Rats because I, I want to ask about, I have a bunch of questions about working on a, mm -hmm. a kid's show. But um, do you feel like a show has a better, because you have a mm -hmm. show on Netflix. Uh, uh, Would you sure. say it for me uh, so Bruce I don't screw it up? Bruce Brothers, yes. Bruce Brothers. Which is not a kid and, show, by the way. Um, <laughs> no. Not a kid show at all. <laughs> I saw the first episode and it was great. But um, do you feel like a, a show has a better chance on Netflix than Fox or NBC? You know, it's interesting. I, I will have to get back to you. I mean, they have a very different um, way of doing things as well. Um I know, you know, because net Netflix is a true, um, world network in a way, you know, they have 160 million yeah. subscribers. So mm -hmm. and we can, yeah, we can talk about it after the kids stuff, but it, it is a, it's a different type of beast because they do care about your ratings obviously. And they, but they also, a lot of it relies on this algorithm that they use, like, you know, for, because they, they're a pure tech company first. So they're getting all this information from all the viewers 24 seven. And a lot of it has to do with things we don't know as much about uh, compared to like just basic ratings on a network television show. Um, I do think there are, yeah, right. And there, this are, is a there are pluses, but, this is, but there may be some negatives too. Right. And this is a really interesting thing that you, probably know a lot more about than I do. But when um, your wife, Amy, my cousin said, you know, Greg's new show is out on Facebook. I saw it on Facebook and in, I'm sorry, not on Facebook, on a Netflix. And I saw it on Netflix and it was one of the top mm -hmm. things that first day. And then I went back to watch it what is it? A couple weeks, three weeks later now, and it took me a while to find it. I didn't actually search for it. I right. wanted to see like where it was, and I had to go down several pages and over. So it took. A, so they're not like push. You know, it's 
three weeks later and they're not pushing it as much as they yeah. were the first day. Um, and that, that helps or hurts oh, you too, really right? Does. Yeah. I've, uh, I've had some conversations to say the least because, you know, you, you, look, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, people can like a show, they can hate it. You just want it. You want to be relevant. You want it to be seen, you know, and, uh, they yeah. have, yep. Yeah, and they Give have different chance. rules for that. And sometimes it's like, you know, well, if the show's doing well, it may stay up there and it's a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy though. But if it, if it got a little bit lower rate, lower, I don't want to say ratings, but it's also a niche show. I mean, it's a very kind of uh, created it to be kind of a, a, uh, sophomoric juvenile humor you know, slants a little bit more towards dudes mm-hmm. drinking beer. Yes. But it, it, it I mean, it, it has moments of other things, but I think that if that's the right. direct audience, you may need to be one of those people having one of those Netflix accounts where it is still featured. And in order for it to change, other people have to watch it okay. and, uh, and binge it. Uh, by the way, please do binge uh, right. Bruce Brothers. <laughs> yeah. Binge away. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if you download a couple other episode, uh, podcast episodes, I'll uh-huh. binge done, the whole thing done. all the way through. <laughs> yeah, look Deal. at that. See? Harder. <laughs> Uh, uh, there you go. So yeah, let's just talk about yeah. Lab Rats real quick. Um, what was it like to work on a kids show? And it was it Disney it was, or uh, Disney it was Junior Disney, uh, was XD, it? which is kind of actually more like the, the XD. Okay, uh, a little bit more male slanted Disney Channel. But um, so that came around. Um, I had just come off Goodwin Games that got canceled early, and I was so frustrating because that meant my. Uh, my the way I make a living was done for that year, but I had some friends actually from that '70s show. Uh, These really funny writers, um, Chris Peterson and Brian Moore, and they had they had created this uh, kids show, and it had already been going for about a year and a half. And uh, they asked me to come help out on it, and I consulted, uh, you know, for like a half a season, just doing a few days a week on it, and then I. I realized, and I just had this look and, you know, I had two younger kids and it was really the first time they thought I was a writer because it was something they could watch. And the one thing that Disney was doing a lot more of then than my, certainly my experience after Goodwin Games is they were producing lots of episodes and I wanted to make content one because I wanted to make a living right. we were doing like 26 episodes, uh, you know, a year. And I was also at the end of the day, I, w- I was working with friends that I had worked with in on adult, you know, shows. Um, and I was having a great time. Uh, now there are certainly things that, uh, make it a little bit more difficult writing, uh, for an action comedy on a Disney sh- uh, channel. But, uh, you know, it, the mm-hmm. fun of that writer's room was, we would all, I mean, actually one of the creators of that 70 show, Mark Brazil was also uh, consulting on it and working and we would have a great time telling all the same jokes we would tell on that 70 show and say, all right, we know we can't do this joke. So it's like writing with one or two hands behind your back, but how can we still make it funny and get something out of it and still do it? Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. And I gotta say, I think uh, I'm very proud of the show. I think it actually was a lot of uh, fun. There was a great little cast and, we were able to. Yeah, I know my kids yeah. watched it. What was yeah, that? Like it went on five, for five six? seasons, which for Disney's like ten seasons. Uh, you, you basically okay, but that was yes, a few yes. years it ago, ended, right? It wasn't recent. Uh, I want to say in twenty sixteen. I think twenty sixteen. Okay, yeah, yeah. So my kids were like mm-hmm. ten and twelve or something. So uh, you know, but it was a, it was a, it was a really Very good experience, cool. and uh, you know, that's uh, just getting back to like advice overall. It's. Uh, a job opportunity came up and I, you know, as soon as you start turning down jobs in this, I'm not saying you take every job. If there's someone that you've worked with that is just a nightmare and you know, there's something else, what well, run away, but I, a great experience. Yes. And also you, you got to work. The, the, there's nothing wrong with taking a job. It just means you're, you're working there. There are so many times in this business where there's months or God, a year where you, you can't find a lot of work and you're living off residuals from a script you wrote. So when you, when, when a job comes up and especially a good one with people you've worked with and you know, you're going to have a, um, an enjoyable experience, you, you jump on it. And I was very happy to work for it. Go yeah. for it. So, so let me just ask you real quick about that. Like, are you, let's talk about hours and you know, you said, uh, that 70s show, you get out early. Uh, a lot of writers have told me that they're working lots of hours. Are you thinking about it at night and, you know, rewriting stuff at midnight and 
is is it like a constant thing for you and and at the off are you at the office a lot and and then the last question is like a, a show like lab rats where you're doing so many episodes are you writing more are you producing more mm -hmm. quicker uh well the first question just about are you taking your work home with you or not i mean it really depends on whether or not you're on staff on a show meaning so i'm a i'm a producer writer okay. on, a, on a show the hours itself depend on what kind of notes you're getting, what kind of showrunner you have. I've been on shows where the showrunner has family issues at home and they just don't want to go home. And you realize, oh my goodness, I'm here till midnight because this person <laughs> wants to avoid their family. Yeah. That is a nightmare. Right. Uh, and there comes yeah. a point where even if you're ordering a dinner or a second dinner at, at work with uh, a bunch of writers, it's not getting any funnier. So that that, that can be a frustrating thing. Right. Um, but the, the thing about you know, showbiz and even with working writers is there are many times where you're just not working or you're looking for that next work. So if you're asking me then, yeah, I try to still give myself some type of schedule in creating in coming up with new ideas or doing something where if not, okay. you'll, uh, you'll drive yourself mad. I think you have to look at it as a job job. Even if you God, even if you're sitting around for two hours trying to think of something and you know, you, you come up with one thing, you, you got to keep, you got to keep, honing your skill. You got to keep writing. You got to keep, you got to keep writing and failing and hating your writing and rewriting. Um, uh, or else when you are under pressure to have to rewrite a script fast or something, I think, um, you may not be as prepared. Right. Cool. All right. So let's go to the, the big finale here. You, are you the showrunner for yes, Bruce, so the Bros? Bruce brothers? This is a project that actually, um, has been around for about five years. I initially, it is my show. I created it. Okay. So I'm the executive producer and the showrunner. Okay. Uh, I actually initially had sold this to a small cable uh, channel called IFC. Yep. It is still around, but mm -hmm. um, they do like Brockmire and stuff. And yep. uh, uh, it almost got picked up there and okay. uh, it did not. <laughs> so normally what happens, I mean, I've sold a lot of pilots that most pilots don't get shot or made and right. uh, that's fine. And you move on. But I just felt, especially with the craft brew industry and, and how it's taken off over the last decade, uh, and they really craft craft breweries have really become today's bars almost throughout oh, the country. Yeah. It's and huge. Uh, especially I just in the refused, cities. Yeah, yeah. I refused to let it go. And I just tried my hardest. I knew the execs over at IFC to get it back. And uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't let it go. And uh, it did take a while. I did some rewriting, I made it a little younger, I, I arced out this first couple of seasons. And then, uh, I took this, uh, with, with my brother who, uh, is, uh, a very accomplished writer and, uh, but it, it's my show. We pitched it to Netflix and, uh, and they bought it. And this was about end of 2018. Okay. So yeah, then, then you go through, um, uh, I mean, I pitched them basically the season and some other episodes and, and had a pilot written, but then I had to, write the series, all eight episodes and cast it and figure out a place to shoot. And, uh, uh, as I said, my brother was an EP on it as well and an executive producer, but he just directed three of the episodes and was around right. a little bit. Cool. And, uh, and then, uh, and yeah, and we shot, uh, last summer at a, uh, at an actual brewery that was, uh, closing down, uh, in downtown LA called iron triangle. But, uh, just to give the, uh, authentic, it really felt authentic because we were, we were, shooting on a yeah, pretty, uh, on a shoestring budget. I know everyone thinks that Netflix will all the, but they have so much money that everything's big. This was mm. definitely a smaller show. So okay. we had to stay for the most part, we stayed in one area, but it was a very large brewery and we were able to shoot all over it and actually make beer. And, and, uh, it, it made it feel like it was, uh, we weren't as claustrophobic as say being on like a set where you only had three sets and you built, right. you built yeah, like no, it definitely brewery. feels, I saw the first episode and it definitely feels like a brewery and you're with all yeah. those giant tanks in the back. And yeah. One yeah. of the guys jumps in there and, uh, yeah. it's very funny. Are you the dorky brother or are you the, uh, uh, uh so the bearded I'm the, brother? <laughs> I'm the bearded guy, Wilhelm, the younger one who okay. uh, kind of more of an every man. And we kind of say in the right. show that Will he wants to, uh, He's just looking for the, he, he is looking for, uh, the brewery to be like the perfect hang where, uh, Adam, the older, uh, 
asshole brother, if you will. Uh, my brother thinks is basically an homage to him. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is loosely autobiographical, at least in the fraternal right. relationship. He's the one who, uh, the cocky jerk who doesn't care about anyone, just wants to make the perfect beer. Right. So that is kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, usually you have a show where the two people kind of complete each other. These two don't even make one person. They're just kind of this uh, hodgepodge. If they could only get out of their own way, they'd, they'd actually have a very successful brewery because uh, they do make great beer. They just, uh, they just, uh, it's a, it's a hard business to run, especially right. if you probably love beer. And I mean, in the real world it is. And I, I really was just amazed there hadn't been a show about it. And, uh, I, you know, just, just want to have, uh, yeah, just, just, uh, enjoying people having fun at a brewery and kind of making, I don't want to say mocking, uh, commenting on, uh, the brewery business itself and the people who come in, but, uh, you know, also embracing it too. I mean, yeah, I, I, in the pitch, I would say, you know, you used to go to a bar to get drunk and now you have to go listen to, you know, every friend tell you how, uh, you know, about the apricot notes and the IPA they're drinking. <laughs> exactly. So everyone's a beer expert and it's annoying and, yeah. and, uh, you know, and I'm making fun of it here, but mind you, I find myself talking the exact same way after doing all this, uh, quote unquote research for uh, going to a bunch of breweries and right, uh, right, right. I do love beer. No, so no, I uh, love craft beer because, uh, like yeah. just because you said, cause sometimes it has peach in it or mango or whatever. Yeah. I think that's cool. But, um, I like the dorky brother. He is an asshole, but I like him. He's kind of like um, Dwight on The Office. He's kind of a jerk, but likable. And um, uh, I kind of really like that character. And then um, I feel like, and obviously this is just episode one, and I'm going to watch, you've shot a a Uh, whole season. And, Eight episodes, yes. And now you're finding you're going to find out if you're going to shoot more or are you uh, shooting yeah. More? So we find out about a season two um, probably in the next couple of months. They really kind of like to gather in all the information they can. For, okay. Uh, the first the, the first month is definitely important though. We want to like so tell all your uh, friends to binge. Yeah, exactly. It's eight episodes. It's uh. Yeah, just some good, clean, filthy fun. Yeah. Well, uh, that's you know, what I a couple felt. Of beers like, and, I really yeah. like. Um, I really like the food truck people. Uh, they're they're a lot of fun. They their, come to the, and they, they don't they have do any come pants back. on, and yeah. they're cracking sex jokes. Like I thought it was very funny. Um, I think so. And we're not, we're I, I would love to, to see more the of wheel. them and that with, with in the future. And I'm sure it's there. So I'll have to watch uh, it more is episodes. There. There's also this very funny uh, actor named Flew Laborg. I'm sure you'll recognize. Uh, you see him. He's been in some movies like Pitch Perfect and stuff. He comes in as a uh, one as one of uh, a group of Trappist monks that come to visit. It will in the brewery uh, in episode four and ends up staying around for a while. But uh, no, I, I just had a blast and it really is a, you know, as a writer, you love, it's the process more than anything that I right. try to enjoy whatever the end product is. And uh, here, you know, um, it's a dream come true. You know, you get to create something that you genuinely believe in and, and like, and I got to work with great actors and cast them and uh, have fun with them. And, uh, they were, they're all just sweethearts. And, you know, we, we, we got to, you know, in 28 days, we shot eight episodes and had a blast and we, we love to, uh, we'd love to do it again. Nice. And when you were there for all the shooting? Yes. Everything. So yeah, cool. and it, that is the beauty of a TV and the editing, were you there for the editing? Ed- you and your Every brother? single day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's really your show. More, you created but, yeah. it. So it makes sense. Well, yeah. And my, my brother's busy with a couple other shows too. Oh, he is? So he is, uh, yeah, he does uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. He and, does. Oh. Um, yes. And he also uh, has a new show on uh, Hulu FXX called uh, Dave with uh, Dave Bird. Little oh, Dicky. Nice. He's a little rapper. Yeah. Very funny. Um, cool. So yeah, he, he was busy. So this was, this was my baby, but uh, it was still fun to work with him. Uh, Awesome. Uh, I'd love to talk to him, uh, sometime. Yeah. Yeah. But let's do, let's do, um, let's wrap it up with, uh, advice. And, Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely going to watch the rest of the episodes. Everybody else should watch it too. And it's, it's brew brothers on brothers Brothers Brothers. on Netflix. Yes. And, uh, so advice, what, I mean, you talked a little bit about, Mm -hmm. um, how to get a job and write a really good script, but any other advice that you'd give to young people or people that maybe want to switch careers in the same industry, get into writing instead of producing stuff like that. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, my, my, my biggest piece of advice and I, I and this may, I, I jokingly say I've never worked an honest day in my life because I've been in the entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. So this may, this may hold true for other professions as well, but you have to, 
um, especially for young people I know are kind of like timid about like asking someone to look at their stuff or try to, you know, use the connections you have. This whole business is built on connections. Yeah. There is maybe when I was in my twenties, although my brother wasn't as successful then, I, I may have been a little timid about that. You need to use every possible connection you can to get anything done. It doesn't mean that they're going to work. It doesn't mean that they're not going to tell you to, um, you know, to, to fuck off. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, but, but the whole point is <clears throat> you, you've got, you can't be afraid of reaching out, especially to, you know, family members and friends of, and friends of friends yep. to try to get your stuff, um, read. Now, mind you, I'm not saying I can do that for everyone on this podcast, but I have certainly, right. because I had tons and tons of help that I have certainly helped, uh, many, many people at least try to get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the other thing I would say is if you want to be a writer or a producer or whatever, write, you've got to keep writing mm -hmm. you have to produce. And now again, maybe it's more with videos and other things you can do to try to get a following some type of, you know, um, social presence. That's fine too, but you have to, it can't just be sitting home alone and, and perfecting the perfect screenplay or the perfect script. It's about, uh, it's about writing and getting better at writing. Right. And that's, that's a, what I've heard a lot is make something, do something, yep. post it. Don't just sit at home and wait for people to contact you, contact everyone, you know, people you don't know, go on LinkedIn and take some classes and, and get involved. You know, a lot of people yep. find uh, work through classes. They find work through connecting, I mean, make a podcast, do something. <laughs> it's so smart. You're right. You have to, and at the end of the day, you'll, you'll be happier doing that anyway. It's like, yeah, because you're because creating. You're creative. You're you need creating. to create. Yep. And and it's okay to fail. You, you're going to fail. I mean, I've, I've failed 95% of the time in this business. I yep. So many shows you just don't get or they don't like your script. They don't buy that pilot. They don't like your joke. you got to keep going. I mean, right, but you learned something way. and you got better. And yep. you're right. And, it is it is like robbing a bank, like working in TV and film industries and even some of the web stuff. Like it's it's it, you're creative, you're having fun, you're making stuff. And it's yep. uh it's something that you love to do. So it's not digging ditches for sure. Yeah, no, and I and I would say I look, I feel completely blessed about that, but I still have that fear running through me and that I'm still trying to spin many plates. I'm I'm developing two other projects right now. One of them I'm going out to pitch regardless of what happens with Bruce Brothers. I mean, I certainly mm -hmm. hope Bruce Brothers comes back a second season. And right. but if I sell something else, fantastic. And we'll work around it and we'll, we'll do it during uh, when we're not in production. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so much. This has been thank great. Thank you, Sean. You're um, very welcome. I was hoping to uh, have a drink with you at a reunion or something, but that's all been postponed. Uh, but the next well, time I go to LA or... You come out to Atlanta or somewhere else, we'll meet up in that Maine. That would with be the, uh, uh, fantastic. And I, I got to say, how nice does that sound to just go out and have a drink with someone? <laughs> you know, I, I, I joke about it and just one more plug for Bruce Brothers, but yeah. it's, we always thought, uh, you know, it'd be, oh, it'd be, let's make people jealous of a great looking beer shot or something. I never thought I'd be making people jealous just by being out in public. Exactly. <laughs> like at a brewery. Yep. You know, and it's, it is, yeah. How we long for just one, uh, one or two normal days. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to uh, go back to restaurants and go to see oh shows and of course theater and symphony and stuff. So awesome, man. Thanks so much for this. Yeah. And I oh, will you're... definitely, uh, text you when it's posted and all that good stuff. But thanks again, Greg. Excellent. Oh, you're very welcome, Sean. Great talking to you. Great talking to you, man. Have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. You too. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where entertainment pros talk about how they made their dream into a career. Subscribe to our YouTube page, like and share our Facebook page, and download at Apple and Google Podcasts. Thanks to Bob Jurgens for the rock and VO and Joseph McDade for the music. Next week, we have a very special guest. It's my great friend, Dan Crosswaite. He is a technical director for NBA TV, an all-around great guy. We have an amazing conversation. Check it out next week.